It's Sunday. Welcome to Global Church Online. Together is better.
I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Well, hello, Global Church, and welcome to Global Church Online. We're glad you're here with us today. Open your Bible to Psalms chapter 34. In Psalms 34, we're going to take a look at the life of King David through the lens of fear and also through the lens of praise. What do you fear as we talk about that subject? What is it that you fear? It just terrorizes you to think about it or to experience it. For some, it's being afraid of airplanes. I don't want to be on an airplane and I would love to land as fast as possible. I wish the trip was sooner. Some of you might simply be afraid of elevators, getting on an elevator and maybe you're trapped inside or you think you're going to be trapped inside. The power goes out and something happens and all of a sudden you find yourself in the worst situation possible. Some of us might be afraid of snakes. You know, the old, there's a snake in your boot type of thing. And when we hear about a snake, all of a sudden we, we are afraid. But Fear is something that we know it can paralyze us. Sometimes we're, fe you know, we're fearful of things or locations or places, but what happens when we fear people? Well, when you and I fear people, oftentimes what happens is it takes away our focus from God. So we're going to start today with this simple idea. When we fear God, we can stop fearing others. When we fear God, we can stop fearing others. Let's take a look at the context of Psalms 34. In Psalm 34, we find that David was in a very unusual situation. David had been rejected by Israel, by his country, and for whatever reason, and we don't know exactly why, but for whatever reason, David decided to go get the sword that he used to cut off Goliath's head take that sword and take himself to his enemies, not only to his enemies, but to the hometown of Goliath. We don't know what he was thinking. We don't know what his issue was, but David went and did something very, very foolish. Now, let's be honest. You and I have done foolish things before, things we haven't really thought through, things that maybe we spontaneously decided, I'm going to do this, but really they were unwise. 
David did something really, really unwise. But aren't you glad, I know I am, that God helps us even when we make unwise decisions, even when we do things that really don't make sense. So now all of a sudden, David in Psalm 34, he is with his men and he is in a cave and he is telling his men what had happened. What had happened? Well, David went to visit this king, the king of his enemies, and he took Goliath's sword with them. And all of a sudden, he realized that he was going to die. They had arrested him. They brought him before the king. And David was afraid. Now, what do you do when you're afraid? What, what sometimes happens is we begin to pray and say, Lord, and it may be silently, it may not be out loud, but we say, Lord, please help me. And David prayed and God rescued him. And David acted crazy to get himself out of this predicament. But in the middle of all this craziness, God stepped in, God rescued David, and David went to tell his men about it. As God does things in your life, as he does things in my life, listen, we need to tell people about it. Don't just keep it to yourself. Tell other people about God's faithfulness and what God has done. So let's take a look at Psalm chapter 34, starting in verse 1. It says the following. David tells his men and he tells Israel, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually, notice that word, continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Now this is a classic phrase or a chorus in a song. Here it goes. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let's say that last part all together. Ready? Here we go. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. One of the things that we find to be true is that it is good for you. It is good for us to praise God at all times. Praise him in the morning. Praise him in the afternoon. Praise him in the evening. God wants to hear praise coming out of your mouth and out of mine. He wants to hear the things that he has done celebrated on our lips. The other thing that David does is he says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. But he's telling his men, he goes, Hey guys, magnify the Lord with me. Let's do this together. Let's magnify the Lord. Let, you know, God is already great. I am not going to make him greater, but I can let other people know about his greatness. So let's do this together. Let's exalt his name together. That leads us to our first point. Here it is. When we seek God, we can be satisfied in him. When we seek God, we can be satisfied in him. Now let's take a look at Psalm 34, verse 4. David said, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. What did David do? And this is a warning for you and it's a warning for me. David was rejected by Israel. He was down. He was a broken man. And what did he decide to do? Go grab my sword. I'm going to take what, you know, my trophy sword and I'm going to march in into the presence of the king of my enemies. Not good, dude. Not good at all. So David decided when he was at his lowest point to look to his enemies, to look to the people who didn't pursue God. That makes absolutely no sense at all. Why would you in your lowest moment go to someone who rejects God? Well, we do that when we're not thinking clearly. We do that when we take our eyes off of the Lord. God wants us to keep our eyes on him. Listen, we all get down. We all get discouraged. But don't go to the people who reject God for encouragement. Go to God and let him encourage you. That's really, really important. The other thing I want you to know is no matter what is happening around us, God knows what you are facing. He's totally aware of the difficulties you face even right now. He's totally aware of the fears that you have even right now. 
But notice that word radiant in Psalm 34. God is transforming us. When I look to God, you know what happens? God transforms me. When I look to God, when I seek his presence, God transforms me. He changes my heart when I look to him. When I look to those who reject God, that does nothing good for me. Take a look here at verse 6. David described himself as a poor man. He says, This poor man cried, notice the humility, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. So humility before God is really, really important. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So as you and I go before God, maybe this morning, maybe this evening, go to God humbly. Don't think you're all that. No, no, no. God is great and glorious and strong and mighty. We are not. We need to approach God in humility. He says, this poor man cried. Again, he looked to his enemies. What did he get? He almost lost his life. But he turned to God, and maybe it was right as he was facing the king. He turned to God, and he asked God for help. Lord, please help me. You'll notice on the verse where it says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Listen, God has angels all around. Now, you may have heard some weird things about angels, and I, I get that. But listen, God has angels around this earth. That's a reality. There are, there are demons. There are angels. No, they're not responsible for everything that happens, but God sends his angels to protect his people. In this particular case, David reflects that the Lord himself came to protect him, to really put a hedge around him and strengthen him. So David in this psalm was hopeful. He said, you know, yes, I did something dumb. That was foolish. But I know, and I knew, that God was going to deliver me. So here's the question. Do you have that confidence? Do you have that hope that God's going to help you through the difficulties you're facing today, even if some of those difficulties have nothing to do with God? They were totally you going in the direction that you wanted to go, and now you realize, man, that was really, really not smart. Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me for just walking away and looking at ungodly advice. Lord, please forgive me and lead me back to you. Notice what it says here again. When we fear God, we can stop fearing others. When we fear God, we can stop fearing others. So let's review the first point and then we'll get into the second. When we seek God, we can be satisfied in Him. When we seek God, we can be satisfied in Him. And the point that follows is, number two, when we fear God, we can experience Him. When we fear God, we can experience Him. Now, this idea about fearing God, you may have heard things that have been all over the place. Let me help you with a very simple understanding, a very simple definition. Here it is. The fear of the Lord means to respect God highly, by loving Him in holy worship. When we fear God, we hold Him up in high esteem. How do we do that? Well, part of the way we do that is by worshiping God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, and all of our might. And then it says, obeying His Word and serving the Lord with all of our heart and soul. So notice the words, respect God highly, loving Him in holy worship, obeying His word and serving the Lord with all of our heart and soul. Let's take a look at verse 8. David says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. O oh, fear the Lord, you His saints, for those who fear Him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. You and I can gain knowledge in 
a variety of ways, but there are essentially two ways for us to gain knowledge. We can study books, we can do research, or we can experience things ourselves. One of the things that we all enjoy doing is eating. Do you like to eat? I love to eat. I love a good plate of food. Now, I've been told that I don't have the best taste buds, and that's probably true, but I love a good home-cooked meal. Have you ever been to a special event and all of a sudden they bring out these hors d'oeuvres? They're just beautiful and they present these hors d'oeuvres to you and they don't know this, but you're starving. I mean, the hors d'oeuvres are fine, but you really want to get to the main course and, and they give you these hors d'oeuvres and it, it just kind of entices you for more food and it, it just wakens up your your stomach and your stomach is saying, please give me more. But then all of a sudden they bring the main course and you experience the food and the taste of food. You can also spend a lot of time studying this food. You can go to a lab, you can break it down in its chemical composition. You can do all types of data analysis, but listen, you and I both know that when we're hungry, we don't want to study things about food. We want to eat food, and that is much more enjoyable, especially when you're hungry. Now, when we look at God and how God manifests himself to us, he wants us to experience him. He wants us to taste and see that the Lord is good. This was really the mission of Israel. God wanted Israel to give a taste to the nations that surrounded Israel that God was good, that God wanted to help them, and knowing God and experiencing God and His blessings was just beyond words. It was totally beyond words. So this idea where the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good, it's an invitation for you to know God on a personal level. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to know Him and it actually means to taste, to seriously consider. Seriously consider God. Don't just be flippant about it, but seriously consider who God is. And remember, God will not leave you lacking anything. But listen, when you and I are hungry spiritually, the only thing that can really fill our soul and fill our hearts is an experience with God. It's knowing Christ is our Savior and abiding in Christ. That's how we really get to know God. It says here on the screen, when I fear God, I will lack no good thing. Do you really believe that? Do you believe that if you really embrace God and follow God with all of your heart, that you're not going to miss anything? Well, guess what? I have news for you. It's true. If you embrace God in the way that he wants you to embrace him and you pursue God, you're not going to be lacking anything that is good. So here's a question. How could David be hopeful? He was in the presence of this king. He was about to lose his life. How in the world could he be hopeful? It's very simple. The hope that David had was not an external hope. It was an internal hope. Listen, when you and I have an internal hope in Christ, Nothing on the outside, nothing on the exterior can shake that hope for very long. Sure, it may trip us up at times, but we're going to come back because this is what David knew. David knew that God would help him. David knew that God would eventually come through. He was hopeful. So what did he have to do? Well, it's the same thing that you and I have to do. When I am afraid of someone or something, I have to remember who is bigger than that someone and something. I have to align my fears with the reality of who God is. And I have to submit myself to that reality, not to the fear, not to the person, not to the situation. I have to submit those fears to God if I really want to see God through. If I really want to see what God is going to do. Verse 11. Come, now this is David talking to his young men. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days? 
that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. What does David do? David says, okay, guys, listen, I'm going to teach you now. I want to help you understand what the fear of the Lord is. I want this to be clear. Let's follow God. Let's pursue peace because this is what honors the Lord. God's going to take care of us. So let's be encouraged. Don't look at your circumstance. Look at the one who can transform your life and he can change every circumstance. Verse 13, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. What is David telling his guys? He's saying, hey guys, listen, God has a story for you to live and tell others. He really does. David has his story. David is telling his man, hey, listen to what God did in the middle of my foolishness. Listen to how God rescued me. You have to have a story as well. It's great to hear the story of others who have expressed faith in Christ and have seen God help them overcome things and work through trials, but what is your story? Do you have a story? Let's review how we began. When we seek God, we can be satisfied in Him. Number two, when we fear God, we can experience Him. And number three, we're redeemed by God when we trust Him. We're redeemed by God when we trust Him. Let's take a look here at verse 15. David says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and His ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Do you like to be rescued? Well, I would like to be rescued if I was in a very difficult predicament. God sees everything, He hears everything, and He has the power to rescue you and to rescue me. When we speak again of the eyes of the Lord, it really talks about His care. God cares for you. He cares for His people. He is looking out for the things that we need. He hears us. He, he delivers us. And as we said before, there's something special about the heart of God that connects to our pain, that connects to our brokenness, that connects when we are hurting. I don't fully understand it, but there's something that attracts God. I mean, when you're broken and you're hurting and you're at your lowest, God wants to step in. He wants to encourage. He wants to lift you up. David was broken. David's men were broken. They were broke and they were broken. And God looked at him. He looked at his situation and God rescued him. Verse 17. Hear the confidence in David's cry. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. Notice that. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The idea here is like a piece of metal and you have a large hammer that's just beating down on this piece of metal and it's just getting, you know, smaller and is being beaten and you're exhausted and, and you're empty and you're grieved because life is just beating you up is the comparison. That's the idea. And listen, this is when God does his greatest work in us. When we're all beat up, when we're tired, when we're exhausted, when we're weak, when we're sick, God can do some amazing things because at times it's not until we're at that point that you and I actually listen to what God has to say. He gets our attention. Isn't that amazing? When we're broken and we're really sick and we're exhausted and we're grieving and we're in pain, it's amazing how during those times we look and we listen for God to speak. It says here on the screen, God delivers His people from their trials. God delivers His people from their trials. I'm so glad He does. I'm so glad that He doesn't abandon us, 
that God is right there with us during our difficult moments, that He protects us, that He encourages us, He brings other people around us, aren't you? Verse 19, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. Here's the reality. God's not going to rescue you and me from every single problem and trial and tragedy. He's going to let us go through things. God is going to intentionally allow you and me to experience pain in our lives. One of the reasons is that pain draws us to God. It draws us back to God many times. I remember getting a phone call and a guy saying to me, with everything happening with COVID-19 and, and all the pressures and all the changes, God just started getting my attention. He started getting my attention because of the difficulties that I had been facing. And God does that all of the time. So God doesn't always rescue us when we want Him to at that very, very moment. But ultimately, God does deliver us. Because our ultimate deliverance and rescue is not in this life, it's in the life to come as we see our Lord face to face, our Lord Jesus Christ. The other thing I want you to notice in this verse is although David spoke of his own situation, that none of his bones were broken, God rescued him, he was actually looking ahead and speaking ahead at Jesus Christ. When Jesus suffered and died on the cross, none of his bones were broken. It was predicted, and David reinforced this, that none of his bones would be broken. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Look at verse 21. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord, this is key, the Lord redeems the life of His servants. None of those who take refuge in Him will be condemned. So as you and I put our faith in Christ, we're not going to be condemned. There is now no condemnation, none at all, to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us. So we go back to our key point. Here it is. When we fear God, we can stop fearing God others. And notice this last point here on the screen. God redeems us when we trust Him and helps us when we call on Him. Let's say that all together. Ready? God redeems us when we trust Him and helps us when we call on Him. Let's remember what David said back in verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So what's the application for you and for us and for me today? This is so important. Here it is. God wants you to know him through experience. He doesn't want us simply to hear about God's goodness in the life of other people. I love hearing stories. Don't get me wrong. But I want God in my life to be true, to be real. I don't want to just hear about other people and what God has done in their life. And believe me, I love to hear that. But more than anything, we should desire God's work in our own life. Because God wants to write a story in our life of experience. Experiencing God ourselves. For you and I to experience God we have to go through His Son, Jesus Christ. This is so important. The way we come to know the Father is through the Son. And as we close our time together, I'd like to remind you of four key principles. The first one is love. We reviewed this a few weeks ago. God loves you. God loves you with an eternal love. But there is truth, our second point. The truth is that we have all sinned. All of us have sinned. We fall short of the glory of God. And this sin separates you and it separates me from God forever, not just for a while. That's the truth of our situation. Before God, we are all sinners and we are condemned to hell and eternal separation. But there's good news. And this good news actually comes in the form of justice. 
Jesus Christ came. He was the justice of God. He lived a life without sin. He went to the cross. He was crucified, murdered on a cross. He shed his blood and he died. They buried him in a tomb. And after three days, he rose again from the grave. Why did Jesus do this? Well, Jesus died to connect you to God. He died so that you could have access to the Father. How do you have peace with God? It's through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's the only way. And the Bible tells us you have to repent from your sins. You have to turn away like David did. David went to evil. He went to those who rejected God. And God says, don't do that. Turn away from that. Turn away from the sins of your past. Admit that you are a sinner and turn to God. And then the second part is believe. First, you repent. Second, you believe. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You believe that He is Lord and you confess your sins to Him. As always, we're here to help. If you would like to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you say, hey, I've never experienced God. I've heard about God. I have friends or family members who have told me about God, but I personally have never experienced a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're here to help. Go ahead and text us your name, 305-677-0172. Text us your name and just let us know, I would like to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. I pray for everyone listening to this broadcast. Lord, for those who already know you, may they not turn back to those who reject you, but may they look to you and follow you and be hopeful knowing that you are with them no matter what the situation. And for those, Father, who have yet to know you, they do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, I pray would they text us and let us know so that we can call them and reach out to them and connect them to you and connect them to your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I sought the Lord And He answered me And delivered me From every fear And those who look on Him Are radiant Never be ashamed. Never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard me and saved me from my enemy, the Son of.
today has been a blessing for you. As always, we are here to serve you and your family, so please don't hesitate to reach out. May God bless you, have a great week, and we'll see you again next weekend at Global Church Online.